everyone, and welcome back once again to the TetraCast. This is RPG Sites' weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. My name is Brian Vitale, and it's been a very, very busy weekend. Uh, joining me today for this news-packed episode of the podcast, I have Josh Torres. It's not E3, E3 season. We have Adam Vitale. Tired. We have James Galizio. Hey, folks. And we have Chow Min Wu. How's it going? So as we record this podcast right now, we have just kind of witnessed and watched through several of the earlier of the summer gaming streams. We had the Guerrilla Collective 3.0 showcase. Uh, Literally in a few minutes, as we record right now, as I speak into the microphone, we have Games Radar's future gaming show stream. Uh, Acquire had a uh, publisher showcase a few days back. Adam and Josh, as we go through all the news of today, can talk about all the different things that we've had to keep track of in terms of where all these announcements are coming from. The long story short is that as we cover all the things that have come out of these different digital shows, showcases uh this is going to be a news focused episode uh we'll talk a little bit about games we've been playing but a lot of that stuff is also games that we're planning to cover as they release uh next month and later and beyond so this is going to try to be our best attempt to go through what's been shown uh what's of interest to rpg fans the the order of things that are coming out all the new announcements and try to make it in as digestible a format as possible for you guys So we're going to not go through a section where we talk about games we've been playing for this week. That will return uh, possibly next week, though more on that later because there's still stuff coming up uh, by the time we record next week with the Xbox showcase, the Square Enix showcase, uh, PC gaming show and all things like that. Before I go too much into the news section, I do at least want to shout out a couple things that have gone up on the website uh, here at the front of the podcast. Uh, first off, I do want to talk about a review that was put up on to the website uh, in the middle of last week, and that is a review for Koromon. So this is one of the Pokemon likes that was uh, released around the March time frame back when you know people were playing Elden Ring and Stranger of Paradise and didn't quite get covered right in the time uh, when it was launched. But we got a review up now, uh, Paige. Uh, contributor to the site was able to write up her thoughts on Koromon. So go ahead and give that a look through uh, up on her, up on the site for her review. Now that we had a chance to get back to it and give it the uh, the coverage that it deserved. And then James mentioned last week on the podcast that he was writing up a feature on the housing situation in Final Fantasy XIV. If you listen to last week's uh, episode of the podcast, he went into detail about his thoughts on that, his personal experience with the housing situation uh, with the release of the 6.1 patch. So that is now in written form up on the site. And now here's the first major piece of news. Uh, we've been covering, as the trailers have released over the last couple of weeks, the updates for the upcoming Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. We kind of asked ourselves, we were wondering when we were going to see, or if we were going to see, the Ashen Wolves added to this spinoff game. And we learned that, yes, they are. But also on top of that, we got a release of a demo for the game. And also while we're here, some of us have had the chance to go hands-on with the demo. So I think Josh has. I don't know if, uh, if Chow or anyone else here has, but figured also we'd get the opportunity to talk about the demo release here. Ahead of the demo, Cullen, Cullen Black, another contributor to the site, was able to write up his impressions of a preview slice of the game as well. So Cullen is a big fan of the series, and he really liked the the uh, what he had access to a lot. So he has his preview up on the site, calling Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes the full package. So go ahead and give that a read through. Um, but we'll continue by, I'll hand it off to Josh here. I know that you had some time to go through the, uh, the public demo that was made available alongside the Ashen Wolves announcement. Uh, Josh, I don't know if you how big of a Dynasty Warriors fan you are or if you're more of a Fire Emblem fan. So just kind of tell us uh, what your experience with the demo so far has been with Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. Yeah, I've been a, kind of a big fan of Dynasty Warriors for a long time, to be honest. I do like my, my Musou games. So, you know, the, I, I always like seeing, but for better or worse, mostly I, I follow Omega Forces releases. Uh, not all of them, but a good chunk of them, especially like the mainline Dynasty Warriors uh, franchise. But uh, I'm really surprised by how much I'm liking uh, the Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes uh, game. That, you know, basically... Uh, Muso spinoff to the Fire Emblem Three Houses mainline Fire Emblem game. Uh, Cullen does a really, really great job, like kind of breaking it down, like what what to expect from this. But this is really continuing uh, Omega Forces like step up uh, into like the bringing the Muso formula like to the next level. Like you saw a little bit of it with Persona Five Strikers, 
you see a little bit of an age of calamity with performance issues aside but and but i think a lot of like the what the next evolution of these kinds of games are is kind of embodied uh in the persona 5 uh spin-off of, of that uh Fire so Emblem. I have to ask, I just yeah. have to ask straight out. And since I know when Cullen was writing up and kind of voicing his impressions on the demo, he was really, or not the demo, his preview uh, access, he was really impressed with the performance of Three Hopes compared to uh, Age of Calamity. Now that we have a demo available, I was just wondering if your impressions on the game's performance were were the same. I mean, Age of Cal- like, it, it, that's one of those weird things, right? Like, yes, it's a step up from Age of Calamity because Age of Calamity was such in the bottom of the barrel when it came to performance. So it's like, well, it's like at least running at like 20 to 25 FPS, like when it gets really heavy, instead of like Age of Calamity's like 10 to 11, uh, if that, you know. Uh, this game, it does hold its frame rate up like around 30 for the most part. But, you know, there'll be some times where the game chugs like when it gets very, very like particle effects heavy, but it gets to be like a lot of things on the screen at once like there'll be like a certain like some special moves that like the main original character says does that'll just like you know kind of speed down the action because there's so many effects coming out it's like a like a really big tornado or like a really big like fast like blade slash that like acts as a projectile and there's just a lot of troops uh you know surrounding you like it'll 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 see dips but it's not as drastic as age of calamity but that's because Age of Calamity was really down there. If you, if you have worse than Age of Calamity, then we'd have a really big issue on our hands. Yeah, um, and normally I wouldn't like my me immediately say like we have a new we have access to hands on with a new game. The first thing I want to talk about is performance, but Age of Calamity was so bad that I figured we just got to bring that up right at the start here. So good to hear that it's uh it went the only direction it should have, which was better than what we got with Age of Calamity. Yeah, I think what really um, caught me off guard was Shez is not a silent protagonist. They're very chatty that they have their own personality and their own role in the story. They're very, uh, they're an active participant uh, when they, uh, you know, uh, interact with the the, the three uh, factions in the, from Three Houses, the Black Eagles, Go- uh, Golden Deer, and Blue Lions. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of the game, you know, the, the, during the tutorial section. Um, you you take on the role of Shez, and then they're like they're in the midst of a battle about to head off into their final confrontations with Geralt's uh, mercenaries. You know, which was one of the major you know one of the major uh, players in Three Houses early on. And then you actually confront the protagonist of the Three Houses, Byleth, uh, at the end of this. And it's like one of those uh, in, uh, encounters where you're like you're supposed to lose, so you're not you're barely doing any damage, and then they they wipe the floor with you. Even even when you like get your like power up mode, uh, so like Shez is a swordsman early on, but like in this tutorial boss encounter with Byleth, like there's like a hit and a power uh, power that's awakening in them, and then they get a second sword, and they're all powered up, and they 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 go from like a, a Myrmidon class into like the the Flugel class uh, when they get the second sword and and power up. Um, but you don't really know exactly like what's going on yet. Like it's still very much like this is how uh, Musou games like with uh, it's an act- action RPG. You know, you have your light attacks, heavy attacks. Um, I forgot exactly how the first Fire Emblem crossover Musou game uh, went, but in this game, you have like two skills that you can use on your uh, equipped weapon, and every time you use those skills, it's the the, the durability of the weapon will go down. So that like you can treat that like a, a sort of like a mana uh, bar almost of like you can't just spam these skills. They do have a cost associated uh, with them. Um, and but you know as as the uh, battle rages on, you can like fill it up with like consumables uh, and stuff that you encounter along the battlefield as well. Um, after you get done with this tutorial, um, you know th- there is a time travel element. Uh, I forgot the 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 green haired goddess's name in three houses. Uh, the the Sothis. The... Yeah, yeah. So you do have like a <laughs> Sothis like equivalent. All three of you just in, in sequence like Sothis. Huh? So when you yeah, say time uh, travel element, so I, I want to make sure I'm clear on something. When you yeah. say time travel element, you mean time skip or literally time travel? Time travel element. Yeah, time oh, wow. travel element. Of course. Where, like uh, there's a Sothis equivalent that uh, Shaz has named Arval. You don't really know their their, their trite identity, but you do know that what's established is that this Arval uh, character has the power to uh, travel back, Shez back through time. So 
like in the in the tutorial, Shaz's like uh, mercenary squad just gets completely obliterated, wiped out. Everyone's gone, dead. So Arvo's like, "All right, okay, I guess we'll do this again. Hopefully, you don't like screw up." So they you know, they actually transport Shaz back through time, and the the real start of the story is e- even before like the like that time period when Byleth was about to like enter the academy. Instead, instead of Byleth uh, entering the Garrig Mock, it's uh, your character. Your character is uh, still under like the guise of a mercenary, and then they they are discovered by the heads of the three houses, um, slightly to the west of Garrig Mock, like in a forest. They're trying. The, your character is trying to find this village uh, where, like you know, the people that they knew for the mercenary squad post you know before before they got time skipped back. They're trying to find them. So they're discovered by the three houses. You help them out with like a nearby bandit, and then um, you know they ask you, "Hey, come along with us." You know that's we'll, we'll compensate you for helping us out. And this is kind of where the first like tutorial camp section is, where you get to see some of the characters from three houses. Uh, there you interact with them, kind of you know just introductory greeting, uh, get to know them for like this is clearly for like people who haven't played three houses, like kind of catching you up on the situation who these uh characters are and uh, of course for this game like what abilities they may have so you know you're kind of get you kind of get ripped along you just you as shaz just uh, like you're a mercenary all you want to do is get paid but you're kind of roped along into joining garrick mock because you know you do want to get stronger as well so you, you can uh not repeat uh past mistakes as so, someone who it, hasn't played three hopes demo yet whenever you say you i keep thinking byleth i go no wait shez shez shez, shez yep guess. shez yeah but byleth is out of the picture for, for right now the, they they don't even like you, you, they don't even join garrick mock uh like right now um you you as shez like uh, join as a student uh and then you're uh taught by uh geralt i think his name is Ger- jaritza jaritza uh and um and so you Pick one of the three houses to join, just like in the uh, main game, and then they're kind of your starter characters uh, in battle. I didn't get too far into it. I only did like one more uh, battle after you joined a house with them. But what is the really interesting thing about this game is it tries to incorporate some of the, some of the strategy RPG elements from the mainline Fire Emblem games into this game, where you can pause at any time during mid battle. And it'll go to like a, a overhead screen with like with like pixel sprites to depict like your character and the other supporting characters that you have, and then you can like kind of assign them like, hey, uh, your class is advantageous to like the base captain of this base. Go and attack them, you know, because you have advantage, and you'll even get like the the percentages of like how likely they are to overtake that base. So like. If you're like an advantageous class, you might have like a ninety-one percent chance of being successful of like of that AI assigned character to take over that base. Of course, you you at any time can also switch to any of your uh, allies on the battlefield, which with the D-pad as well, and you, it'll transport you towards where they are, and they're the playable character instantaneously uh, as well. Um, so it's trying to like incorporate uh, like hit chance, critical chance into an action game. Yeah, a, 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 a little bit. Yeah, like with the class adv- uh, advantage system, it does try to incorporate that into them. So you're not like overwhelmed and like trying to do everything by yourself. It is also interesting that like when you start up the game, obviously you have the, your easy, normal, hard um, difficulties, but you also have the option of going um, the doing classic mode or just the the normal or casual mode, where uh, it says at the difficulty select screen if you choose classic mode that like you can start perma losing characters after chapter four obviously the demo goes up to chapter four we don't know i don't know what happens i haven't gotten there yet but the, the it specifically mentions from chapter four onwards if you hit pick this option if any ally falls in the field they are perma gone so it's like okay well that's does, interesting. Any, does any other Tennessee warriors game have anything like that i don't know if the i don't know if the previous fire emblem game the uh dynasty warriors game has that i i totally forgot but the not no not uh, if it's not that one then none of them have had it from from, from what I remember, um so that's an interesting twist to it. Apparently, it has some sort of death penalty. I just just a quick Google here. I did not play the original Fire Emblem Warriors. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, once they die, you have to resurrect them using high grade materials. So it's like oh. a penalty. 
Okay. Well, this one it says you just you just flat out permanently lose them. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. I, I mean, and uh, as far as like gameplay goes, like aside, like obviously, I I wish this was higher frame rate. Sure, like the thirty FPS is fine. Obviously, but you know, it, it it's okay. Like I I enjoy like fighting in it. You can uh uh like pair up with other car- nearby allies and have them like help you out in like special attacks uh with you. And obviously, when you're facing off against like the like captains and special units out of the battlefield like you do have to take into account s- sort of like the class advent uh, advantage system because if you're you'll take more damage that you you would want if you're if you're not pressing the advantage on there and uh, there's a there's a ranking system after battle where it'll rank you on like time completed enemy soldiers fought and like the amount of damage that you took just like in the main game if you get an s rank you'll get additional goodies and i think you can you can like replay battles after a certain point to do better on the rank with them it does incorporate some age of calamity systems as well especially with like the remember the special demon beast uh units in three houses um they do appear in missions and they're uh they're handled a lot like um age of calamity and and even like that that even extends to like normal like base captains and special units where if you hit them with a certain attack or you perfect guard them um they'll have a a stun meter they'll go into a stun state and then you have to like break the shields to get them to a state where you can do like a special like critical rush attack to do a lot of damage on them that that's uh, back from age calamity and then for like these beasts it works a lot like age of calamity where you have to there are certain parts of their bodies where you can like break them and then you as you whittle down their HP gauges, they'll go to like uh, certain uh, moments where you can like do a critical rush on them, and then you get to the next HP gauge and kind of whittle down their HP again. So they're they're very like multiple uh, like lengthier affairs than uh, no- normal encounters. So it it does borrow that system from Age of Calamity uh, in the game. But I've only I've only played just a little bit of it. It seems to appropriate a lot of like systems that uh, Three Houses players are uh you know familiar with like you know with the the bond system uh that that is incorporated in the game uh the more you use a skill uh that'll get upgraded there's a uh, like you know a class advancement system that they've been showing off in the, the promotional materials for this game um it seems to be uh like you know as cullen said the uh, it feels like the full package even this early on like they've really gone to the drawing drawing board and be like how do we how do we translate like elements of fire emblem three houses in a way that feels faithful but in, in our own you know muso formula and for I, I, you know for people who don't like the muso formula i don't know if this will be the game that'll change it but it is an interesting um re- reimagining of like what if like three houses was as closely as faithfully as possible uh features wise but in an action rpg context I do think just on paper, this approach is more interesting than the, uh, like the original Final Warriors. It's like, here's the crossover approach. Yeah, we'll have like some sort of original story to go with it, but like it ends up just feeling kind of like pure fan service. And I know this is also kind of like fan service, but when you have the crossover story where it's like, here's all your favorite Fire Emblem characters and a new story, I guess I've voiced my, my general kind of aversion to crossovers, uh, in, just in gaming in general, it's just something I don't find myself enjoying. I like just on paper the idea of we'll take this established world and whether or not it's canon or not is beside the point. Just like we're just going to tell a new story with these characters and we'll just kind of put our own twist on it. And you can figure out if you want whether it fits into the current like chronology or not. I just think it's a little bit more like the the Three Hopes approach is more interesting or even like the Age of Calamity approach is more interesting than the original iteration of both of those uh Hyrule Warriors or Fire Emblem Warriors, just on paper. I would have played more of Age of Calamity, I think, than if like I was just so turned off by the performance uh, issues and then also just having other games to play. So the fact that that is not quite as bad for Three Hopes makes me more likely that I'll go ahead and uh, give this one a chance once it releases uh, later in the month. So the next time we talk about uh, Fire Emblem Three Hopes will probably be with the full release, which is in about two weeks from the time of recording i just want to make sure with the uh with the new final trailer that launched alongside the demo announcement uh, i'm not i don't think we missed anything it doesn't look like there's going to be a standalone trailer for the monastery personnel because the final trailer did show characters like uh seteth and shamir did we ever learn whether or not Catherine is in this game just like 
They don't know. Oddly, I have no idea. Apparently, yeah. Sorry, apparently she's in the game, but maybe not playable. So I'm huh. But interesting. That's I don't I don't know for sure. I'm not playing it. What about what about yeah. my my bro Alois, or whatever his name is? I'm not sure. Guess not. But yeah, in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about the full release of our game and get our full final thoughts and hopefully get a uh, review up on the site along with that. No, so thank you, Josh, for uh, telling us about your time that you've had hands on with the demo. And also uh, go uh, read Colin's preview impressions uh, up on the site as well. He's very, very positive on it. The other big preview feature that we were able to put up on the site this week uh, is for the upcoming, I guess, deck builder strategy RPG, Marvel Midnight Suns. So... Uh, I guess to get this out of the way first, uh, during the Summer of Gaming 2022 Fest, I think this was primary during uh, Jeff Keighley's stage, we got a release date for this game. It was originally supposed to release this spring, it was delayed, and now it will be releasing on October 7th. But more interestingly, uh, we got a trailer alongside the release date announcement as well. But more interestingly, uh, site contributor Scott White was able to head off to Firaxis Studios in Baltimore to go hands-on with the game and capture a lot of footage from his time with it. And what we were able to do is go and put our uh, put the impressions of Scott's time with Marvel Midnight Suns on our YouTube channel. So he kind of showed us the footage. We had me, Adam, Josh, and James just kind of query him, talk about what he what he thought of the game, what we were watching. So if you go to uh, the RPG site YouTube uh, channel... Uh, it's you. It's it, well, Adam wasn't there. It was it you, me, James? Oh, it wasn't Scott. Adam. All right. I don't know why. I just assumed Adam was there. But yeah, so several of us alongside with Scott, who is effectively driving the uh, the preview presentation, were able to talk about over over an hour of footage, uh, just go through what the game was like, what he what his conversations with the developer, obviously go through some of the stuff we were seeing with the game. So that is up on the YouTube channel right now. If you want to see just the, the footage in its entirety, but also he wrote up a, a written accompanying piece up on the site as well, talking about his time with the game. Uh, from what we saw with the preview footage, it's it looks really kind of unique. It's a it's a, an interesting new spin on a game. Sometimes you might think, oh, it's another Marvel property. I've seen this before. I'm not interested. But Firaxis has really kind of made a a gameplay style that's really tailored to what they're kind of goals are with this game they originally tried to make it like an XCOM like and learn that that didn't work so well so they ended up trying a few other things and arrived at this uh card based deck builder that they ended up at which I know for some people they're going to be initially turned off by that but from the footage I saw it looked like something that I could see myself getting into uh so I guess I'll kind yeah. of let the footage in the preview sort of speak for itself because there's a lot uh that we went through there that you can see up on either the site or the YouTube channel yeah, I, I think I think that worth mentioning here, like uh, on the podcast too, is that you know uh, Scott did uh, show off like what the microtransactions in that game would look like, because that's that's still like a, a feature that like they haven't really been so forthcoming in like sharing um, for whatever reason, you know. But uh, they they did like mention uh, what they, what they showed to Scott is that there'll be uh, like people have to buy into a currency, an in-game currency. To purchase like cosmetics for the other superheroes, I, I, I believe it's not all cosmetics, but there are definitely some cosmetics that are uh, locked behind uh, paying more uh, for it. But as far as we know, that's the only thing as of right now uh, for for its micro microtransactions. And then Scott, you know, uh, expressed some worries over like hopefully they commit to only sticking with that as the being the microtransactions because there are definitely some systems of the game that are ripe for them and you can see them easily implementing it if they wanted to but as of right now it's only just for cosmetics for the other heroes it just but seems I so like it seems like an interesting implementation that's hard to feel like give them the benefit of the doubt because uh, it's a single player game but with a premium currency as if it were some sort of like like it had an online component or a free to play component or a gotcha component when it's like why does it have this like the fact that it has payable cosmetics is kind of that's just the world we live in you know every rpg well not every rpg so many rpgs nowadays come with some like you can pay extra money here or there in a microtransaction or somewhere to get you know to deck out your characters or whatever but the fact that they're not doing that here but they're instead implementing a premium currency in a single player game it just seems like why do it that way it's i don't know yeah. it's, it's hard not to feel skeptical in some way 
Definitely. But, you know, I, I, but for people interested in like seeing more of the game, we have a lot of coverage for it on the site with Scott's written preview and our uh, the video preview he did uh, for the site. Really, uh, really amazing job all around. He, he absolutely killed it in his uh, visit to Baltimore uh, and met up with the four Axis folks about it. It's uh, to anyone, to anyone who is any, like, if any part of the game is like interesting to you, please check it out. It's, it's great. Yeah, and Scott put a lot of work into that. We recorded the footage, and then like two days later, he had it edited up on the site. And then on top of that, he wrote up his preview impressions as an accompanying piece. So uh, at least give one of those a watch through or a read through. Uh, Scott put a lot of work into it, and I think it's an interesting game that we'll have to keep eyes on and see how we end up feeling about it once it releases. Uh, again, it, it also got a new trailer with the Summer Games Fest for its release date for October 7th. Yeah, and, I, and, and like the, the main like, headliner there was you know they uh confirmed that spider-man would be a playable character there but they also had some character teases uh with the trailer with scarlet witch venom and hulk uh being corrupted uh by the antagonist who wanted mm-hmm. to face off against them in the game all right so now we're going into the section of this podcast where we're going to try to organize all the different trailers and announcements that have come out of course the across the summer of gaming kind of incentives from all the different publishers and all the different showcases. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, announcements that were made during the Summer Games Fest 2022 Jeff Keighley stage. I forget if it has a more specific name than that. Uh, Summer Games Fest Live. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So uh, anyone who watched this, this was kind of like in the middle of the day for us in North America. Uh had some different takeaways about what they thought of the event, but we were, there was a few uh, things that we could pull out that were of interest to RPG fans, and two of them are from Hoyoverse, and these are both games that we've covered on the podcast previously. Uh, the first one we'll go into is a new trailer for Honkai Star Rail. This is Hoyoverse's new turn-based RPG. I think in some cases they also call it a strategy RPG, so it's turn-based. It's You can consider it strategy-like, which is interesting because that means it's not like their um, Genshin Impact or Honkai, not Honkai Impact, what's the, what's the existing Honkai game called? Honkai Impact Third. Oh, it is Third uh, Impact. Okay. So this is for Honkai Star Rail, and they showed a new trailer of 90 seconds, basically showing the premise of the game and teasing a new location, uh, Zhangzhou Lufo. I know they pronounce it at the very end. So uh, this okay, game... Cha, cha. How, do you, how do you pronounce this? Because we're going to mess up this pronunciation. I'll mess it up, too, because it's Mandarin, and I speak Cantonese. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> shit. See, that's my excuse. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm waiting for a hon- uh, a game from Holy Wars where they dub it in Cantonese. I would die for a Cantonese dub. It's always Mandarin, Mandarin this. But when can It'll I get never a Cantonese happen, dub? Considering that, like you know how like it's yeah, a, it's I know. a mandate. But yeah, I wish it was a thing. But yeah, the trailer is yeah. really flashy. It goes through some of the characters that we've covered in the past, such as March seventh. Is that the right one? Seventh, yeah. seventh. Yeah, and. <laughs> Uh, and the rocker chick, whose name I also, who, whose name I forget, uh, and so, Serval. Yeah, so it's, it's a really flashy trailer. It kind of showcases the premise uh, and some new art and some new characters. And no new announcement in terms of a release date or a release window, but it's. I, I imagine just, it's close. They, they they just wrapped up their second closed beta. Um, that people in our community have actually partaken in that second closed beta uh, and have been talking about it in our Discord. And uh, their thoughts on it—they they seem to be—they they seem to be liking it. Yeah, I, I imagine this uh, this game will be coming out in a few months uh, at the most. It has. To and be. right now, it's only announced as, as far as I can tell for PC and mobile. So just, uh, yeah, yeah. So just keeping that uh, listed out front. And then the more recent game that was only recently announced that they also showed up a trailer for uh, at the Summer Games Fest 2022 live was a new trailer for Zenless Zone Zero. This is their new action uh, IP, action RPG IP taking place in an urban setting that we talked about on the podcast about a month ago. And this is kind of a a combat character trailer that focuses on basically showcasing some of the combos that like three or four of the different characters can do. And I really enjoy the the giant like bear in a white coat character i forgot I, I i bet i think his name is detailed on one of the official websites but i forget what it was uh this obviously kind of a different feel from the uh the honkai star rail trailer which is more of a story premise cutscenes, where this one is uh gameplay and i kind of have the same feeling that i did with the um 
with the announcement trailer here is that the the camera panning on this action game is so like swift and fluid and flashy. I don't know if I'm just older now, but I'm like, I almost get dizzy watching it. It's really flashy and really like, I don't know, really good production values, but uh, I'm almost it's, just kind of. It's okay. I've, I've heard common sentiments from some of my older friends too. It's like, uh, like they like they're the gameplay itself is cool, but the way that the trailers are edited are too frenetic. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, very chaotic. I was going to ask a question, Brian, have you ever seen the Raiden Shogun trailer? For Genshin Impact, uh, I believe I did watch it when it was announced, but I can't pull it to mind right now exactly what it showed. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, that guess... trailer is so over the top edited, and <laughs> you're probably getting the same feel probably from it. Yeah, because yeah, I guess Crazy I guess I said that this was a gameplay trailer, but it's clearly like edited with you know dev tools so that they can get like interesting perspectives and pan the shot. It's not how the game will look when you play it in. The fact that there's no UI is kind of indicative of that. So I'm get I'm I'm guessing it'll be fine once you're just playing it from you know an over the shoulder or behind the character perspective. But the trailer is edited so that the camera is like always panning around to show off of you know the the animations, which is really stylish and really fluid and really flashy. But I don't know, just a little bit dizzying as well. Uh, yeah, also, uh, no um no details on a release date for this. This one is probably further out because obviously it was just more recently announced. Yeah, they're still taking applications for their upcoming closed beta, which doesn't have a date yet. Uh, just in the in the time span between its release, uh, uh, that's initial announcement, and then what what new info uh, was revealed here. Uh, they've been doing some social media stuff uh, on their official Twitter, uh, introducing um, like three characters, like Ambi Damara, and B, not Andy Damara, Nicole Damara, and Billy Kid. And Billy Kid looks like the budget Ragna, the Blood Edge character from the game. And then they're part of the Cunning Hairs Dispatch Agency. So, you know, at the beginning of this trailer, they like show people in silhouettes, and then they're all they all come from different like agencies uh, for the game. And then they they talk about like you know some of like the world building type of stuff in this game uh, on their social media as well, concerning like what a hollow is and like what life is like in, in the game uh, living by hollows. You know, it's just kind of like flavor text stuff. Um, you know, trying to teasing more and more info as the project is coming together. Yeah, and it's kind of cool to see that uh, Mihoyo slash Hoyoverse is working on these two projects in parallel because they're, you know, they've got the the action based game with Zen the Zone Zero and the turn based uh, kind of approach with a Honkai Star Rail. And yeah, this is on top of like still putting out content updates for Honkai Impact Third and Genshin Impact. So you know, the development hasn't stopped for those either. So they're just all over all over the place after growing so much uh, over the years. I will say, though, that as someone who only more casually has viewed these trailers, like these trailers are very character focused. If you don't pay too much attention, a.k.a. me, sometimes I'm, I have to like remind myself which characters are from which game. Uh, obviously, the Honkai Star Rail takes place uh, in the future in space and the other one's like an urban setting and their outfits kind of are designed to match. So it's pretty easy to keep them straight. But just the fact that they're so character focused trying to keep the rosters aligned uh, requires a little bit of paying attention on who which who is announced for for which game at least for me maybe i'm just slow though no uh, i, I it. think it's I easy to figure it out just from what they're wearing i mean mm-hmm. each game has a very unique uh was it aesthetic that you could kind of recognize they're from which one if you didn't know anything about the games like and then you started pulling in like Honkai Impact and Genshin Impact characters into it and asked the person uh tell me which of the four Mihoyo games uh these are from I think that would be difficult. <laughs> and we also obviously don't know any new details about if and how these will have gacha elements similar to Genshin Impact in terms of uh, ascending or characters or things like that. I I'm sure they're going to copy the Genshin model. You got to whale for for six duplicates to get the max of it. Well, we'll see. Here's a new trailer that I think was not announced as part of any showcase, but just provided from uh, Nice America. And this is kind of an interesting trailer. We know that we're looking forward to the uh, September release of the official English localization of Trails from Zero. And a couple months back, we got a character trailer showing the special support section and the four members for that release. Uh, nice America has released a, ca- a character trailer for the follow-up to that game trails to azure which is currently slated to release in english officially next year in 2023 but they've gone ahead and uh just given us the character trailer you know i guess ahead of time before trails from zero even releases i guess the the fact that they gave us this trailer is more interesting than maybe the trailer contents itself because obviously several of the characters are shared between the two games and then to the trails to azure 
character trailer introduces the the expanded cast that the follow-up game has kind of cool to see that nice america is trying to market these games uh when, now that they're finally officially released in english in english though we did not get any we thought we might get more details on a release date for trails to azure for next year but it's still just slated as slated as a general 2023 release yeah the the the, the main reason for all of this is because they were uh, starting up pre-orders for the limited edition for trails to azure on their uh site oh gotcha yeah so that that'll have obviously the game a sound like a uh, soundtrack with 10 select tracks on them acrylic stand steel book cloth poster and a collector's box so it's a, like the character character trailer is like more like a consequence of them putting up mm-hmm. pre-orders of that something they could package with it yeah yeah uh, and uh just in my defense over the last week there has been like 30 or 40 different trailers from different publishers yeah. all over all up and down the spectrum and you'll uh, you'll probably hear a bit of that as we go into some of the later releases from some of the later showcases as we kind of pull together i've covered some news adam and josh have covered a ton of news uh, james has also covered news as well over the last week in terms of all these releases so we might need to just kind of collectively come together and put all the uh, all the news in a digestible order and kind of get us all on the same page for all of these depending on which streams we paid attention to and which streams we followed up on after the fact and to kick that off uh one of the earliest streams uh, sh- sh- streaming showcases, digital events, whatever you want to call it, for this summer kind of deluge was from Acquire Games. And they announced kind of three different things that we have covered here up on the site that are of interest to RPG fans. Uh, one of which is they announced, without a lot of details, but they announced an upcoming remaster for Class of Heroes 2, which is a game that originally released uh, for the PSP back in 2009. So they did not give any details about this remaster, and the PSP version of the game is still available on the PSN on PS3. But they did also they just announced that a remaster is uh is on the way. Did anyone here uh, play Clash of Heroes 2? No, but I'm more interested in what publisher gets it. Yeah, I don't know who would get it at this point, right? Like if if it was gonna get if it, if it was gonna get a Western release, who would pick it up? I know mm-hmm. some people were. So oh, have we talked about the Clash of Heroes spinoff tactical game yet? Not yet. Uh, we're, yeah. we're, we're about to get to it. But uh, So that game, what's, what's it called? Academia? Uh, Advent, uh, Adventure Academia, The Fractured Continent. Yeah, so I guess I'm preempting Brian's next topic here, but they well, also you can, announced You can introduce that. the topic if you want. Yeah, they also announced this game, which is a, kind of like a tactical RPG set in the same world as Class of Heroes. Um, and the interesting thing here is that this got an English trailer and a Steam page, uh, that says it's coming soon, but it's kind of awkward because the Steam page says, even though all the description and everything's in English and there's English screenshots, it says like it's not available in English. So that might be an error. I'm not sure. Um, but we don't know the date for that. And it's like, is this self published or not? Um, and it doesn't mention about the console entries. Then uh, I know some people speculated maybe Clouded Leopard Entertainment might be localizing this because they've done a few. Uh, English localizations like Relayer and whatnot. And sure enough, Clouded Leopard Entertainment did announce that they are going to be localizing the game for Asian markets, but not in English. So what I'm getting at is here is that we're, it's kind of confusing and we're not sure who is, who is going to be publishing it in the West and what platforms it's going to be on and when it's going to be announced. So who or knows, revealed, uh, or Victor released. Ireland might show up from, <laughs> from out of nowhere <laughs> and we'll localize this game. Yeah, uh, who knows? Oh God, that'd be kind of terrifying. But yeah, I mean the 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 new game that they showed off, the Adventure Academia. It like it is looks to be like a strategy strategy tactical RPG. It looks like a like a chibi art style. Looks very cute. Um, and they showed off like a little bit of a gameplay uh, during that uh, uh, choir live stream as well, um, where you're kind of like so it's not like a it's not like turn based. I, I think uh, when in the footage that he showed off, but it's like. An isometric angle of like them wading through like a map and like encountering monsters uh, along the way. So it looks to be like you know pretty cool. Um, but it's I I don't know if it's gonna get an, like an official English release. Who knows? Like it's just so weird how the way they unveiled this and the way they put it up on Steam and like got like eighty percent of like the way there and then said English not supported. It's like okay, yeah, English okay. trailer, it's the Steam page. Which the uh, the Clash of Heroes two remaster news did not get, but still it doesn't the, seem like it's quite confirmed. 
do you think this is going to be like a weird scenario like they did with um when bandai namco only released things in south for southeast asian markets but with for but had like an english release there do you think it's going to be one of those things where like technically quote unquote this is not released to the west but you can get it on pc it'll be all just fine i i highly doubt it because it's i don't get it <laughs> like some of these screens like are perfectly fine in, in english it's like okay yeah i don't know i feel like there's only one reason they did such a thing it was just to avoid licensing issues but i don't think this game would have to deal with such a limbo so it's like why why would they have to do that i don't know does acquire still have like a presence in america like like an actual like western branch do you know adam I don't think so. They do. They were, they're very, very quiet. Oh. Or, do, or, does ev- or does everything just go through like Exceeded Marvelous for them? In the so they, I know they work with them, but I don't know if they're like, that's their pipeline. Yeah, usually it's Exceed. <laughs> the last thing that was announced uh, that we have covered on, on our site from the Acquire Games Showcase was a release date in Japan for Labyrinth of Zangetsu which I believe is a game that we've covered previously uh, on the Tetracast about like a year and a half it's been ago. A while. <laughs> so uh, it will be releasing in Japan on September 29th. We don't have uh, any new information about our English localization at all. I don't know. It's kind of, as you can see with all the other acquired games that might not be indicative of anything. It's hard to tell for, for certain because this was a, a Japanese focused streaming event. Yeah, they showed off some gameplay of this. This looks like a very, very cool uh, dungeon crawler with a monochromatic style. I, I'm sure we'll see it in uh, a Western release so, sooner rather than later, I'd have to imagine. Moving on from on some other announcements that have taken place over the last handful of days, uh, we're going to try to order, organize this in like release window, starting with things that don't have set release windows, and then kind of going in chronological order, like what are the things we can ex- expect sooner uh, than the, the things that have been pushed back. Uh, a few a few of the games with alongside new trailers have been delayed into next year or, uh, or pushed back otherwise. Uh, I'm going to start with two games. Now for indie games, whenever we say like announced or revealed, we kind of use that language loosely because sometimes these indie games, they'll they'll like reveal new footage or screenshots on like independent discords. Then they'll have a Kickstarter or something and then they'll get picked up by a publisher to like re-reveal the game. So a lot of these are games that we're kind of covering for potentially the first or maybe second time, though they've been in development for a while in a public stance. Uh, We're going to start out with a game from Black Tower Basement is the developer called greed inventory so this is a kind of a point and click action rpg where it has a very like grim dark gothic sort of art style but it's played as far as i can tell from this uh, announcement trailer with entirely with your mouse so you like click on areas of the enemy you have like a perspective where you see your character moving uh, left to right across the screen facing the enemy as if you were lined up in a traditional rpg sense but it's entirely played with a mouse so the trailer that we that we got for this is very gameplay focused and tries to show that though i'm not sure it's the sort of thing that kind of demos very well but josh you were the one that originally kind of, kind of gathered all the information for this game up together to cover it on the site uh was there anything about this game that you thought was striking and worth kind of calling out yeah, this uh, this game's pretty cool because it's kind of like a side scroller uh, game where you travel from left to right, and then as you're running along that path, you encounter monsters, and then you know you like you said, it seems to be a very mouse centric type of game where you like execute attacks by clicking on enemies, uh, you know, to do like uh, whatever whatever you have on you to attack them with. But uh, incoming attacks have to be like parried to mitigate damage like at the right time, and like presumably like at the right like place at where the attack is about to hit you um well with that and then there's also like part of the trailer where like there's like some uh lightning potions about to hit the character they like they they like reflected it back to the enemy um and only took a little bit of damage from that it took and then obviously the that attack was uh reflected back at them so i mean it's a it's a very interesting angle in terms of like just how you can approach action rpgs in a very um non-traditional manner uh, and more, and it's more, it's more like a point-and-click adventure with action RPG elements and a loot, uh, loot element. Like the the inventory is much like you'd see in a Diablo game with the way it's slotted in, and how multi- some, some like equipment will take multiple slots, and you have to kind of do some some tetrising around to be efficient with your inventory space. So it looks pretty cool. Um, I'm interested to learn more about it and see more about it. But 
this is one of one of the games that like ca- caught my eye. I'm like, oh, this is really really uh, awesome what they're presenting here. Yeah, uh, cl- currently only slated for PC. Uh, a lot of these games, as they've been revealed by their indie publishers, uh, indie developers are offering demo opportunities. As far as I can tell, no demo quite here yet. This one looks like it's one of the ones that's furthest out. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it has an interesting it. art style. Uh, we shared it on Twitter, and people seem to really think that it looks quite quite sick. This will be the first game from this uh, Ukraine-based developer, the Black Tower Basement. So mm-hmm. uh, they have they have an interesting uh, concept and idea on their hands, and I uh, wish them the best of luck. You know. Yeah, and again, that's called a greed inventory. Inventory only the first syllable is replaced with the word greed. Uh, another RPG that has been in development for a while, but kind of got re re unveiled during the Gorilla Collective 3.0 showcase, is a game called Alterium Shift. Uh, this game is a little bit more uh, more straightforward. It is a like a 16-bit Chrono Trigger Final Fantasy VI inspired JRPG from a like a two-person developer called Dratzy Games, and it has like a an interesting art style. It's got multiple protagonists it's got a combat system that seems heavily inspired by chrono trigger uh they are got recently picked up by a publisher gravity games arise company which i guess publishes a lot of mobile games but this game currently is slated for pc and just generic consoles they haven't specified which ones uh it has a demo already available uh on the game steam and itch.io pages but alongside being announcing that they've been picked up by the publisher, they're planning to release a new demo for this game, Alterium Shift, in quarter three of this year. The game itself is currently slated for still for 2022. I don't know if we'll see it, but uh, it, it has the art style and the like the pixel aesthetic that is very emblematic of like Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger. So obviously that's kind of a very popular, uh, well-worn sort of aesthetic, but this game looks promising. It has an art style. Like I know there's been some games, like I remember we talked about Rise of the Third Power, which is a similar sort of game that released back in February earlier this year on the podcast. And I said, I liked everything about the game in the pixel art uh, aesthetic, but not from the 2D art here. I think the 2D art also looks really good. Uh, So just kind of a, a game to keep an eye on uh, that you can actually go and play right now with the current demo on Steam. It's really kind of impressive that it's primarily a two-person job, uh, a two-person project on this so far, and it's their debut game as well. Yeah, you'd never think it uh, just like looking at it in motion. Mm-hmm. Another game that was uh, announced that is currently just to be announced uh, release date for 2022 is Scald Against the Black Priory. Uh, this is a retro RPG that takes like it basically instead of drawing inspiration from like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI, draws from like you know classic Ultima games. So uh, I guess I, I've seen kind of some of the art from this. It looks really kind of very striking. It has a little bit more retro, more like eight bit aesthetic rather than sixteen uh, bit. Uh, I don't know if you saw anything here as you were poking through uh, getting this news to post up that you think is worth calling out on this one, Josh. Yeah, Adam and I have uh, have uh, reported on this before. Like, this is very much uh, a direct homage to like the the golden era uh, of our uh, computer RPGs, uh, uh, late eighties to early nineties uh, type dealios, uh, especially you know when it comes to the gold box series of uh, RPGs. Um, it's a very very cool. You know, just <laughs> it really it really transports you back. Like if you remember those games, even like you know if you've seen them before, it's like yeah, this is definitely. It is caters to a certain era of game, like the like the new trailer. Boomer shows, like, gaming, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like you know, like uh, the, the the new trailer shows out like various like event scenes that had like NPCs uh, show up in them, and like the the art style for the NPCs in this game is is really something else. It looks like a classic like King's Quest type art. Obviously, it doesn't play like that, but that's kind of the, yeah. the time period that I'm transported back to when i seen footage of this so again to try to keep those straight those three games that are not dated but we got new trailers for are uh greed Ventory, ulterium shift and scald against the black priori priori i don't know why i pronounce it like that it's like prior pri- priority <laughs> but without the it uh, here's a game that I'm actually pretty excited to try out, hopefully soon. Uh, we actually talked about this game a few weeks ago on the podcast, and that is Symphony of War, the Nephilim Saga. And if you recall the name, I don't remember where that was mentioned before. We talked about how Scott White, the same uh, contributor that did the Marvel Midnight Suns preview for us, 
back in uh, March, I believe, uh, attended PAX East and was able to go hands-on with a handful of games. We talked about WrestleQuest, we talked about a few others, and one of the other ones that we talked about was Symphony of War of the Nephilim Saga, which is a Tactics Ogre slash Fire Emblem inspired indie RPG. And when he, during that episode of the podcast, we brought up his preview feature for the game. And then in the last week, it was effectively shadow dropped onto both Steam and the Epic Game Store. So Symphony of War, the Nephilim Saga, released last week and is available to play for, uh, looks like, $15.99 US dollars. So kind of a surprise launch. We got a new trailer alongside of it. It looks very, very like inspired and kind of like we, our preview from Scott was kind of glowing and it looks really feature rich and really kind of harkens back to the days of the the classic Fire Emblem uh, from like the GBA and earlier. So I don't know. This game looks really neat. Uh, in fact, in our Discord earlier, Alex Donaldson was like, what is this? We should cover it. And we're like, we got it. We got it, boss. We're on it. This might be a game that once the, once the news kind of dies down, hopefully you can get some hands-on impressions uh, talking about this game. And also, Scott's working on a review for it as we speak. So maybe we'll be able to refer back to that and see if his final impressions have uh, have changed since he went hands-on back in uh, back in March. Yeah, this looks to be a, like very much a hidden gem. Uh, you know, for, for people who already uh, you know, played it, uh, uh, Shadow dropped on June 10th. Uh, like on the Steam page, like just there's a nothing but like glowing praise and reviews uh, for the game uh, already. The people who've gotten hands on on it, and the it the people who really had had like that itch for like a new ogre battle. You know, this is really doing it for them. And the the, the launch trailer for it is very striking. It, it says a lot in such a short amount of time, and you're just like, wow, there's like a density to this game that uh, I really want to uh, try it out as well when when I get the chance. But mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's very it's going to be very busy here for the next few months, so we'll see. Yeah, now I feel kind of silly because I said tactics over when I'm in uh, I'm in order battle. I yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Another uh, turn-based RPG that has been kind of announced for a while, but semi-recently got picked up by a new publisher is a new strategy turn-based tactical RPG called Tyrant's Blessing. Uh, this had a Kickstarter back in april of last year they partnered with publisher freedom games back in last september but we got a uh a new trailer this week as part of the freedoms games showcase i believe mm-hmm. so i think uh, adam was the one that covered this one no it was also josh or maybe you both kind of covered this but uh this is a game that when we say like tactical RPG, we've kind of joked on it on the podcast before, like, was this inspired by Final Fantasy Tactics? Uh, this one, they ex- actually explicitly say that they were inspired by games such as like Into the Breach, but with an RPG, more a more RPG type spin on it. So it looks a little bit different. It looks a little bit, uh, it has that same sort of like 16-bit art style as Final Fantasy Tactics, but it has uh, kind of a more strategy flair to it and less, maybe less of an RPG flair. It's hard to tell based bit, uh, just on the trailer. Uh, this is slated to release this summer, which it's not technically summer yet, but that's, you know, that's not too long away. And summer is already kind of a busy time. So I'm not sure we'll be able to cover this game when it comes out assuming it's not delayed not unlike the other games which are undated or potentially coming out late late in the year this is a game that uh we might build a go hands-on in not too long from now yeah i really want to uh try this game out because you know the, they do mention into the breach of invisible ink and uh but into the, the the year that into the breach uh came out that was my game of the year uh, so uh them saying hey this is like into the breach i'm like okay you've got my attention um the, the everything they've like shown about it is very very much like into the breach uh, with a heavy emphasis of like having a very restrictive like sort of party formation where you can only take up to three characters and one pet with you into like seemingly like overwhelming encounters and it's up to you to kind of exploit the strengths and weaknesses of your party into your advantage and what will determine what your party composition is is like what into what sorts of like map layout and environment uh, you're uh, heading off into like obviously like say an open field wouldn't be good for an assassin but would be good for an archer and like the one of the main hooks of this game is when that like when uh, an enemy targets you and you try to run away it will immediately attack you so like you're very much encouraged to if you're gonna face something on either be committed or have like contingency plans to when things might go bad and not uh your way so like on their official site like they give ways to kind of maybe get out of like sticky situations. Like if an enemy's about to attack you, you can hide like in a nearby like tile that may have like an environment in it, like a bush to hide in, or you can have like your pet, uh, like pull, uh, have your character be pulled by them, or have your tank push your character out of the way. So it's very, very positioning focused, like uh, 
into the breach where you can kind of manipulate the uh, the positions of uh characters with other external factors whether that's environment or through other characters and like into the breach like you can see ahead of time exactly what the enemy will do in reaction to what you're doing so you can you already have a good idea of like what the enemy is going to do on their next turn but that that's not to mean that's going to be easy like take it from anyone who's played into the breach that game is fucking hard <laughs> Just because you know what they're about to do doesn't mean that like oh this will be a piece of cake. It's like you really have to. There will be turns into the breach that takes that that's taking me like twenty to twenty five minutes just to think of what I'm gonna do next because that that was like it was such a tricky situation to be like okay how do I mitigate my losses or damage intake with this next move because every single move counts and one bad move is all it takes to end the run. Um, so it's, I, I really, really, really like that aspect of it. There's a certain tension to it that made each and every single move like impactful. So if it is going for that kind of style, um, sign me up. I'm, I really want to check this game out. Um, by the way, if you want to check it out, it does have a, uh, demo available on steam. However, it's one of those like limited time demos. It's listed here that it's only available until June 27th. So go ahead and give it a, uh, a look if you're interested. And you can go hands on and see uh, what you think about it. Now, back in February, we got a teaser from Interplay Entertainment about a potential re release for Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2, which wasn't, you know, a complete surprise because the original Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance was re released for uh, consoles and I think and PC uh, last year in December. And now we got the official word that Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2 uh, will be re-released in summer 2022 for PlayStation 4 and 5, Nintendo Switch, uh, Xbox Series 1, and PC. So basically re-released for everything. So not too much of a surprise. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 1 looks like it did pretty well for them last year. And now they're following up and re-releasing Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. Uh, no specific date yet, but just for this summer. And alongside the uh, release date trailer, they did... Uh, give us a new sorry alongside the release date announcement they did give us a new trailer just showing some of the remastered gameplay in action and it still does support a uh, local co-op well the steam version has the uh remote play together feature yeah and uh, but uh, as far as i know they never added like an on like an official online uh play like to the first one so like if you want to play with friends online you really have to uh rely on that steam remote play feature to get it mm. to get it done here is something that we actually have a, a hard date for. Uh, we got an announcement from Dongan Entertainment that Vistaria Saga 2, the sacred store of Sylvanister, will be launching on PC on July 28th. Uh, if you don't remember, Vistaria Saga are a, well, now it's a series of tactical RPGs that are overseen by the original Fire Emblem creator Shozu Kaga and with character designs from people who have also worked on previous Fire Emblem games, such as Mayumi Hirota, who worked on uh, Thracia 776. So Vistaria Saga 1 released, uh, what, like 2018? It's, it's been a few years now. Uh, but so Vistaria Saga 2 will be releasing uh, in July uh, on the 28th. So I remember Vistaria Saga 1 when it came out. I was interested in playing it because the classic Fire Emblem was one of my favorite series, but I never got around to it. But it's really cool that it did well enough to uh, to get a sequel. This was originally slated to be like a Gaiden entry, like a spinoff, but was recently like retitled as the Vistaria Saga 2 instead. Uh, we got a new trailer for it. Uh, this looks more like... Um, uh, maybe a little bit less like GBA Fire Emblem and more like Super Nintendo Fire Emblem, more like uh, 3 c 76 or... Uh, Genealogy of the Holy War. So it's kind of got a little bit more of a retro feel to it. Guys. Yeah, I, I always, whenever we bring up that Fire Emblem 4, the remaster is going to be announced any day now, guys. Uh, it's my favorite game of all time. Yeah, I'll tell I, you that. No, I, I'm, I like vicariously enjoy how enthusiastic you are about that game. And I'm excited for the hypothetical whenever our remaster is announced, what your, what your feedback is going to be on it. Uh, but yeah, Vistaria Saga 2, if you're, if you play through, if you play through Symphony War and Nephilim Saga and still don't have enough classic Fire Emblem like game in your in your blood, then Vistaria Saga 2 is only a, a month and a half away. Well, if you know Japanese, was it how it goes is that it was free in Japan and here you're just paying for the translation? Is that is that what business do you Oh that for Vistaria Saga? That I actually yeah. am not aware of. Yeah, that's the same for the original. Oh, okay. Well, you know what to do, Chow. Well, 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 it's time to check it out, maybe. 
Another uh, indie game that we've talked about on the podcast previously, I believe this was like maybe two years ago. Uh, this is a game called No Place for Bravery. Uh, we originally got this uh, announced back in uh, around the uh, E3 time frame of 2020. Uh, was E3 in here in 2020? Was that the first digital E3? I don't remember. All the years blend together now. But back in the back in the summer time frame of two years I ago, we got uh, E3. Right. Uh, we got the announcement of No Place for Bravery. We got an official release date for it now. It'll be releasing on September 22nd for Steam and Switch. So this is a, uh, a kind of an 8-bit styled game with which kind of feel features action-based combat that they call like Sekiro-esque only in like a pixel format. And it's got a very like striking, unique art style. That's pretty like gory and grim dark without, but it's, I don't know, it's hard to describe in words, but it's the, it doesn't quite look like what the greed Ventory did with like the Gothic style. It looks uh, a little bit more like sword and sorcery, but very interesting game. we got a new trailer alongside the release date uh, and that'll be launching in September. Guess what also is launching in September? This is kind of a bit of a twist, a bit of a tangent. <laughs> uh-huh. Go on. Yeah, we, we, we have this organized just by chronology. So like genre or publisher is just kind of up in the air. Uh, launching in September, we've got The Legends of Heroes, Kuro no Kaseki 2, Crimson Sin, at least in I, Japan. I, I knew this was going to happen. This is why I was so happy that Xenoblade 3 was moved up. <laughs> I mean, there's, like, there's, like, there's one of those things that's it's really funny because my my, my friends and I, I, I'm already like that, already taking this as a as a as a given. It's like, wait, didn't they already announce that? It's like, no, this is we already knew. You know, you can, they, uh, you can tell time by when uh, Falcom releases their games. Yeah, like like we all we all know we know the release dates of all future Falcom games. Pretty this much, is exactly one year after Kuro One came out. Exactly, <laughs> which also came out like like one year. Uh... No, 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 no. Hajimari was an exception. It came out it? earlier in the summer, and then it had a later update in the fall with. The, oh right, that's the one. Uh, corridor post games. Yeah. Okay. But so you're right, you're right. Uh, normally it's like that because I remember that East Nine in 2019 came out on September 29th. Yeah, they're pretty. They're they're pretty consistent with this last week of September. Uh, re- release day in Japan, which uh, the which I guess Nice America is trying to emulate with Trails to Zero <laughs> or Trails from Zero. Um, yeah, th- this is an interesting uh, news story for this one because like the like the release date is whatever, but the the it's coming you- out about like the structure of the game. It's like oh my god, it's more like Hajimari in a sense. I'm really so, excited. <laughs> so people who played Hajimari, which is probably not many of our listeners, that and you know they'll they'll get around to it when Trails of the Reverie comes out. But uh, returning characters Swin and Nadia from uh, Hajimari are, are back in uh, Corona Kiseki too. They were the new main characters for the new C route, the third route in Hajimari. So. You had uh, Reen's route and uh, Lloyd's route in Hajimari. Then you had C's route, and then Sven and Nadia were in there. Um, you learn about them here, uh, there, and then they come back uh, in Kuro to work with Vaughn. Um, Nadia looks like Miku now, but with pink hair. Yeah. Did, did people get upset because they bumped up her age, even though it was... Those people can literally go die in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what what that I I didn't look into that I don't want to look into that it's just okay whatever, um, so the they kind of gave a new uh new info on like the way this uh game unfolds uh different to the first Kuro Nikaseki. um in Kuro Nikaseki one um it's very much your typical hey a chapter starts um uh, and it's your typical like uh you're investigating what's going on but the the events that unfold are very linear. Uh, in this one, uh, when chapters start in Kuro no Kiseki 2, uh, Vaughn kind of splits off with his collaborators. So there's Vaughn's party and then like his collaborators' party. And they're all working with each other towards a certain goal in, in, in a certain chapter. But uh, players can decide whether they want to control Vaughn's party or the collaborators' party uh, at first. And then so it kind of it sort of mimics the way Hajimari is structured where a chapter in Hajimari uh, lets players uh, freely uh, decide whether they want to go through Reen's route, Lloyd's route, or C's route for that chapter, and they can switch it midway, whatever they want uh, in, in that chapter, as long as it's confined within that chapter. Um, and then, but everyone has to be 
completed before going into the next chapter. And so. I think personally, the way it worked in Hajimari really helped the pacing of the game. Like Hajimari's pacing is probably the best in the entire series. Uh, the fact that they're doing something similar here gives me very high hopes for how the pacing will be handled. Uh, also, it's very interesting that even though it's not explicitly like a Van's party and Elaine's party and what we do see for this example, they're split off from each other. Like even though it's Swin's party in this screenshot, Elaine's there with Swin's party. And it's like, I wonder if that's something they're going to be doing for the entire game. If it's going to be sort of like an almost dual protagonist system, which would really kind of fit with what with how they announced this game. They showed two characters, Van. Elaine, and then the uh, Crimson uh, Grendel. So I'm really excited to see how that's going to work in practice. Yeah, and then the, the they also uh, showed, like, you know, they had a Dengeki live stream showing off some new clips. So Van was with, was with the church duo, uh, Celis, and um, what, 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 was the other, what was the guy's name? I already forgot. God, um, yeah. I forgot already. Um, and then they had uh, Elaine Swin and uh, Abel uh, or Swin and um, Nadia at their own uh, party. Uh, and then shut off some of their, you know, what they can do in battle. So, you know, it's looking uh, really good. It's looking, uh, it's shaping up to be really, really good. Uh, so, yeah, showing so, the right, yeah. It's showing the right things. Van Celis and Rion. That was a- I can't believe this. Falcon finally redeemed himself, and it's not the best selling game in the series. That's how it is. That's how it is. So, you know, that's kind of just like a like a an early first look of like how Kuro's shaping up. And then for people who can uh access it and read it, uh, that'll be out on September 29th. I'm sure I'll write up some impressions like after I finish it, like I did for the last two games. Oh yeah, they also showed off like some weird like uh action sections where like you had like a swim stealth section. Uh, than just like some other stuff that like, I, you can do. <laughs> like yeah, like wise. yeah, like Swin had like a stealth section, which I saw it, and it's like, oh man, this is a tailing mission from from Judgment. I fucking hate this. <laughs> um, just like looking at the yeah. UI, it's like that's exactly what it's gonna be, huh? Um, it's funny how a bunch of people said that the other section that has a uh, Maya, it or Mare is um. Mm-hmm like a third person shooter but i just poured over that famitsu page and i was like where the hell did they get that from <laughs> it's, i don't think it's a third person shooter all it no. has is it's like it's like if anything it's vaguely like a maze and then there's like quick time events but there's nothing about like a third person shooter or even a shmup so it's like where did they get that it's not even the text <laughs> oh you know People, uh, most of these people just look at the images and say, ah, it vaguely looks like that. I don't think that, you know, they're, they're reading it. So on a related note, I'll just, I'll just bring this up here. Cause it's, yeah. cause it is related. So talking about like new Falcom information coming from Famitsu, uh, Josh or James, correct me if I get the order here a little bit wrong, but we are anticipating getting new information about the next East game and an upcoming issue of Famitsu magazine about a year ago in an interview with uh condo. He revealed that the next, next East game will likely be East 10. So not like a remake of five or what other else people were hoping it could potentially be. Uh, he gave some information at the time about how it's going to be like a new direction or have a kind of like a bigger focus on this game will be a little bit of a shift. Uh, we got some information recently that says that we should expect more information about the upcoming East 10, if that's what it is, uh, in the July 7th issue of the magazine. So not not next week, but uh, within a couple weeks, we should hopefully get some information about the next title in that yeah, series it, as well. It's going to be hitting, it's gonna be hitting sooner than you think, because that, that, that July 7th issue, like how many magazines do it, is like they have the July 7th issue, but this one's releasing on June 23rd. So like within two weeks, really, we'll, we'll start hearing news about it. But to, due to how magazines work, sometimes they'll, they'll have a certain issue for a month, but that issue is coming out like a few weeks before the publications go. Well, I but finally yeah. get to get rid of the party system for once. I think okay. they said that outright the next Seas game was going to be completely different. So I'm different, excited to see what they right. have to show. Like, like, I mean, they said that the the system has been basically building on top of itself since seven and they said they want to do something entirely now so mm-hmm. whatever that means it'll be interesting plus it's going to be on the new engine which i i, I wasn't super hot on with uh kuro when it came out but after the patch and like what we've seen of kuro 2 especially on ps5 it's like yeah 
I'm excited to see what that can do with uh, ease. It's going to be an inverse of Kuroda. You start out in turn-based mode and you go into action mode. Turn-based <laughs> ease game, guys. <laughs> Just like it's ease and strategy, guys. Yeah, what if they yeah. bring back the bump system? I would, oh, take, it. Yeah. I would take anything over the party system. Soul. I, I literally hate the party system, and the only game I ever find that it, it's kind of okay, I can I can stomach this, was in Use 8. But other than that, I, I freaking Have you played Use 9 yet? No, I, I'm still kind of kind of a little bitter about about it. I love Use 8, but I I don't know. I just feel kind of mixed about the party system still. Mm-hmm. Well, East 8's better than East 9, so... Yeah, East 9's <laughs> combat is better than East 8. It's everything else that's kind of uh, take it or leave it. Mm. Yeah, I also like the vertical traversal. In I, I feel like with Yeast 8, it was the story that carried me to play the game more than the, than the game. Oh. Play. oh, I'd say the Yeast 9 story is very good. Um, I've seen some people say they enjoyed it more than 8. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but it definitely has its high moments. Okay, maybe I'll check it out. I do have a copy on a Switch that my cousin lent me. Oh, God, not there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, Yeast 9, I, I like most of it, except I. I didn't like the antagonist, like how he was without any spoilers, just how he was incorporated into the game. It felt very kind of interesting and I didn't gel with it. Yeah. East nine. Um, and I'm sorry for like dragging this on. It just, the current state of East nine reminds me very much of East eight on Vita, but we're not going to get an enhanced version of it. If they're working on Kuro two and now they're like outright saying they're ready to show off the next East game. So I'm not mm-hmm. sure we're going to get that expanded version that East 9 kind of deserves. Because I do believe if it had gotten the chance to be expanded upon, it could have been like overall like better than East 8. It's just... Eh, it's unfortunate. This next bit of news is uh, a little bit out of order. Oops, our bad. Uh, it's about the upcoming Digimon Survive, which of course we've kind of joked in the past is running into release dates around the same time of Xenoblade 3 and Live Alive. Uh, Digimon Survive obviously has had a little bit of a troubled development history, and it's finally coming out this year on July 29th. Uh, We got a new trailer from the uh, Japanese side of things from Bandai Nimco, and this trailer is actually quite interesting and exciting because it finally, finally shows a significant amount of gameplay. We've kind of joked in the past how they've introduced like characters in the trailer. They had a trailer that was pretty much like four minutes of anime cutscenes, uh, which almost made it look like a new show or something. Where here we've got basically six minutes of footage showcasing uh, primarily the, the strategy gameplay elements of this game. So we have that up on the site. It also introduces the new uh, professor character who also gets lost as he's the only adult that I guess gets uh, attached to the digital world in this game. Really cool just to kind of finally see what this game might actually play like rather than just get ideas on the setting and the premise. They also uh, get into and clarify more on like the the details they first shared at that Digimon Con a few months back of like how this game has like a split uh like multiple uh like a split system like uh, where you at a certain point in the st- uh, story it'll branch depending on like your uh karma alignment in the game so there's like a morality system in the game depending on like the decisions that you do and then um there's like kite uh, when you translate it, it goes into like three colors uh where you're like a karma alignment can uh, sway towards to and that'll like the dep- and that'll affect your gameplay so like Whatever like the dominant color is in your like in your karma alignment, you'll follow that story route after a certain point. So like red is like morality, which lets you uh, fuse like vaccine type Digimon. Green has harmony. The Gryffindor Digimon. That's right. <laughs> Basically, Har- yeah, harmony has like data type Digimon. The so, like uh, yeah. Digimon. I don't the, know. I'm making this shit up. Kai, Kai gives an example of like how in the Harmony uh, path that Aguma can digivolve to Tyrannomon uh, and that and that Yellow is Fury, which is sort of like your Chaos-esque alignment uh, and you can uh, fuse Virus-type uh, Digimon through uh, in that uh, path. So, And then the, they didn't explicitly say it here, but at, back at that Digimon uh, con, they said like d- a new game plus for this game would have like new content uh, added to the game as well. That's only available in new game plus. This is a really <laughs> the the structure of this game is continues to really interest me. <laughs> like in a way that's like, how long is this game? How long is a playthrough? And how long will it take to like see like everything that this game has to offer? 
And like, what what percentage is visual novel esque, and what percentage is strategy RPG? And I, I don't yeah. I don't like have a latch on like, is it half and half? Is it more like the Utuara Mono games? Or they've like announced a... this. They've revealed oh, they this did? directly. They said it's seventy oh. percent adventure, thirty percent strategy RPG. When they say adventure, yeah. what do they mean by that? <laughs> They, they mean like uh, talking to people. Like there's like some point and click sections where you use your phone to like look for stuff. Uh, so things like that. All right. So uh, who's gonna play this over Xenoblade Three? Um, you know, people don't have, to, don't have to make the decision. You know, maybe they don't want to get they get both and uh, you know play one over the other first. Wow, well, maybe I could get that limited edition that they had in their store. Oh, the Xenoblade Three one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Seems to that seems to have gone well. Yeah, I don't think that was a good idea putting it exclusive to their store. At, 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 the, at the very least, Atlas got a lot of brownie points for people because the Soul Hackers too. Uh, when the those limited editions went up, it was a lot smoother for people than the Xenoblade Three one. So people, I were also like, think wow, that this works because of the price. It's like that two hundred dollars kind of steeper what they're offering. So, but I, I mean, people. Like Atlas fans will get it no matter what, and they already said like it have very. That, that is categories. true. I mean, I have a friend that is a major game collector, and he would buy anything that has the Atlas brand in it because he think it will be a collector's item. He doesn't care if the game is shit, as long as you see the <laughs> Atlas's brand, he'll buy it. That's so sick, actually. <laughs> but yeah, all snark aside, this tr- new trailer for Digimon shows quite a lot, and it's, I think it's finally the most interesting that they look that we've had on the game. So uh, go ahead and give that a, a look at on the site. And releasing later in the year, and both of these are obviously recent announcements from the week, uh, we have announcement of RPG-adjacent TV shows coming to Netflix. The first one is an anime animated by Studio Trigger called Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Yes, it is the same Cyberpunk as Cyberpunk 2077. So this will be coming to Netflix in September. Uh, it is about a story of a street kid named David who wants to become an edge runner in the Cyberpunk 2077 universe. Uh, and it has it's being directed by, or I don't know if it's being directed by, but it has uh, Hiroyuki Yamashi talent behind it who worked on Gurren Lagann, Kill la Kill, and from Teddy was the director. Yeah. Oh, all right. And so, the yeah. chief, like the the executive, like the character designer and and like executive animator, uh, is. Yo Yoshinari, who also is Studio Trigger. So the, 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 this, the, this is like kind of basically the golden duo of Trigger right here. So they have like Trigger's top talent on this. So that that's why from like an anime standpoint, this is like something that people are lo- looking really forward to because like any any trigger property that like has had both of these uh two on, people really, really loved. They're kind of like the legends. Well, when it comes to Trigger, they could do no wrong except for storytelling. <laughs> they even admit that. That's, that's, that's a big, that's a big but. Except for storytelling, they can do no wrong. But it'll yeah, but animation wise, if they're just hired to animation, it's like you basically got a goose that lays golden eggs. But if you're asking them to tell a story, uh, don't bother. Yeah, whenever uh, whenever there's anime announcements that are adjacent to RPG space, it feels like so many times they're announced and then. They end up not making any waves. I, mean, I this sentiment has been shared before. Hopefully, anyone's not having a too. I mean, a few, a few. I think just very last. I think just last week we were saying, oh yeah, there was a Dragon's Dogma anime. Well, I was like, thinking we, like uh, we completely the, forgot because it just kind of came Scarlet Nexus anime. Did anyone oh, yeah. finish that? Uh, no. I mean, I got it some ways into it, and I was like, I could probably use my time better. And then, of course, we've already we've, we've talked about the um the the Legend of Mana anime. Uh, we're hopefully at some point, we don't know if it's an anime or, or some other type of format, but the uh, Final Fantasy IX show, we thought we were going to see, but didn't. That's in the works somewhere. But yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> There's footage of it out there, I swear to God. <laughs> well, we, we expected to see it, and they announced that they would, and we followed, We tried to follow up, and we said, uh, we don't know where it went. <laughs> we don't know where this was. It was locked in the void. The footage, like, someone, <laughs> someone stepped on it. Someone stepped on the tape. <laughs> And the footage is all gone. Uh, and then uh, in related news, uh, we also got an announcement of another animated series coming to Netflix. This one in December. This is uh, for the Dragon Age series. We talked last week about the announcement of the title for Dragon Age 4 as Dragon Age Dreadwolf. And then last week, we got the announcement of Dragon Age Absolution. So this is an animated series coming to Netflix. I don't know the studio behind it, but it's more of a it's more of an Avatar Western sort of animation style. 
And this is a game that takes place in the Tevinter Imperium, featuring a new elven protagonist who is also joined by several companions that are represent the different races of the Dragon Age series, such as uh, humans and Canari. So we got a new teaser from this for Netflix. This will show in December. Uh, whenever I see all this new information about Dragon Age stuff, I just I haven't followed up on like the comics or the books. Uh, Quentin is actually really uh, appears very like in the know of what the Dragon Age canon is and all the all the story threads that have been introduced and seeded through all the like alternative media outside of the games. So I'm not 100% sure where Dragon Age Absolution fits in, but as it seems like we're going to be waiting a while for Dragon Age 4, this seems like a kind of a cool a cool treat for fans of the series to have an, an animated series to follow uh, for it. It looks like the, uh, the showrunner behind Dragon Age Absolution is Margaret Scott, who has worked on titles such as The Guardians of the Galaxy ca- cartoon and Star Wars Resistance. Oh, also the uh, the, uh, the the studio behind the Dragon Age show. I believe it's a Korean animation studio. I'm trying to remember. They did some other show in the past. I can't remember what it is. Uh, the Witcher, Nightmare of the Wolf. Oh, that's it. Yeah, the Witcher mm-hmm. uh, anime show thing. Witcher had an anime. Yeah. I think it was like a OVA thing. Let me look it up. I'm curious. Didn't 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 it star uh, Geralt's like mentor? Uh, that sounds vaguely familiar. Oh, it's a movie. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is an 83 minute movie. So, it's not oh, really okay. long movie. very short movie. Yeah. So, kind of like I said, almost like an OVA. OVA. Well, at least it wasn't like the Dragon Ball movies back in the day. They were only like a less than an hour long. <laughs> but, yeah. So, for animation fans, we've got the uh, Cyberpunk Edge Runners coming out in September with Studio Trigger. And then we've got the uh, Dragon Age Absolution show coming out in December, both, uh, both on Netflix. Now we're at the part of the announcements where we're talking about what was delayed out of 2022. Uh, this first <laughs> one, this first one is a game that we've talked about previously on the podcast briefly, and that is Sacrifice. This is an indie game from uh, Pixelated Milk. Uh, this is kind of a game. It doesn't have a, specifically the HD 2D engine, but it has sort of like that same sort of feel where it's like 16 bit style, but animated with modern techniques. Uh, so this game is one that it got it got a new trailer as part of the IGN uh, Expo during Summer of Gaming, but did also announce that they were going to push back the release into 2023. Uh, still announced for uh, PC and unspecified consoles. Still looks really neat, but it's something we'll have to look forward to next year. Yeah, we haven't heard from this game since its initial announcement back uh, back in June uh, 2021 when um, uh, Adam covered like its initial Kickstarter campaign. And one of the real big names, like attached to the project, was Motoi Sakuraba, mm-hmm, uh, doing the soundtrack as well, <laughs> doing the Sakuraba soundtrack. <laughs> uh, but it's it, it looks it's shaping up to be uh, look really nice. Like I really like the footage that they show showing off. It's very HD two D inspired, and like how like the the traversal elements kind of reminds me of Valkyrie Profile because there's like a some sort of side scrolling platformer element to it. Um, and you can like run into enemies that you come across, and it'll go into like a, a an odd hybrid like t- turn action turn based like battle system where you can like freely roam around the arena, like three D arena, kind of like tails, but like when you're actually attacking, like uh, it turns to like a more stiff like turn based combo system uh, for those sections. So I'm not exactly sure how it all works, but it looks really nice. Yeah, it almost looks like cleaner than the HD 2D. We've talked out in the past that the HD 2D has a lot of post processing and bloom and blur and things like that depth of field, where this has some of those effects, but it looks like more tastefully implemented. So I'm not I'm not sure if this is just some version of RPG RPG Maker or some like kit that they are able to use, but regardless of what they use to to generate it, the result I think looks really nice and clean. And then here's the uh, here's the bigger one that might be a little bit more uh, I don't know more interesting is that we learned that Grand Blue Fantasy Relink has been delayed to 2023. They did uh, last year reveal that it will be releasing on PlayStation 4, or PlayStation 5, and PC. Adam actually has a pretty good bulleted list on the delay announcement about what we've learned from Grand Blue Fantasy Relink each year, usually almost always making some sort of presence at Grand Blue Fantasy Fest. And maybe not a surprise for people who've been following this game that it's been delayed to 2023. Uh, I don't know if there's really anything more enlightening to say about it. I this mean... Group- like this is one of those weird things where at least like the producer Yuito Kimura is very upfront of like 
they they know right that like people have been really waiting for this for a really long time at this point and they you know cited like you know covid is pr- pretty much a uh, primary concern uh here for delaying it but it, it it just it felt it feels comedic at this point especially when they announced like oh it's coming 2022 at last the last year's grand blue fest it's like oh okay this game is alive it actually has like a release window now that's great and now and what what's holding them back from like saying next year oh this game's like going to be delayed to 2024 it's like okay i guess um i don't know what's going on at this point but uh, they, they said they finished all the assets and stuff but they're just yeah. fine tuning the game for uh-huh. But and then of course we're gonna hear more about it at this year's grand blue fest like all the other times so like what, what else can you say at this point you're just like yeah like the, the development of this game has been a fucking mess and hopefully at the other side of it but it presumably releases like the wait have won't have will have been worth it hopefully you know like i, I still want to know exactly what happened behind the scenes between side games and platinum games for this game um like, i heard rumors that they were expensive and they just wanted to switch to somebody else i can see that you know but i don't know is platinum games that expensive for this well they said they were overcharged that's what it, rumors i heard <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll probably never know the full truth, or yeah. it'll be somewhere in the middle. But yeah, but it's kind of I, it's, it's, this source is kind of credible to me because he mentioned like he told me about the story about uh, Hideo Kojima and the and the beach story before that like, the game even came out. So, oh, Chow's Chow's got the inside <laughs> scoop. I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, Chow. But okay. <laughs> it was talking about the Princess Beach moment. <laughs> okay. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. This doesn't sound legit. That's funny. It, it made it into the game, so... Well, uh, uh, regardless of whether or not you trust Chow's unverified source, uh, we're kind of just in the same boat that we're, uh, we've are we been in this game, just kind of in waiting mode. Yeah, this and, is all speculation at this point, so... And at Grand Blue Fantasy Fest, it's, sometimes we get a lot of information and a lot of new gameplay. Sometimes we don't get very much at all. Who knows what end of the scale we'll see this year. I mean, you'd, think it, you'd think if they're planning to release next year that They'd have a decent amount of stuff to show, but I guess who knows? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just sucks because I don't want to like go get up at some weird hour now for Grand Blue Fest again just to see this game. Ugh, that's the worst part. Uh, well, I'm still hoping updates for their mobile because they haven't updated the game in like hardly ever. The only recently they changed something is a huge gameplay change because there's one summon that was really broken and they finally decided to address that after two years. Because apparently the summon lets you trivialize all the super hard bosses. Right. Sure, I guess. I mean, I don't follow ground. They address it because they feel like it would screw up their gameplay because all the puzzles can be solved by just using the summon. Because in the game it goes like, if you use a summon, it will reset the cooldowns for all your skills. And if you equip all four of them, you just spam 40 skills all at once and it will trivialize every single raid in the game, right? So they finally decided to address that instead of letting the in the game kind of hemorrhage itself. But I don't know. Uh, a lot of people seems kind of like a hit and miss in the mobile game right now because of the lack of updates with COVID. Well, we will uh, follow up with when, when is Grand Blue Fantasy Fest? Is it in December or January? Or neither? Uh, it's the summer. Oh, it's a summer okay. event. Wow. Well, Why no, do you think it was a winter event? No, 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 but there's a, there's a summer event going on right now. I know, but th- there's a summer. The, the one that we're talking about is in December. They, they hold yeah, that, that's one. the big one. Yeah, yeah, and that's the next time we'll hear news on uh, Relink. So we'll keep you in the know, but we don't know what to expect. Uh, here's an interesting uh, announcement. We have learned from Katakawa Games that Metal Max Wild West is canceled. Uh, this is a game that we talked about on the podcast, I think, in the middle of last year. It was uh, kind of rebranded under the Wild West name. It was originally Metal Max Xeno Reborn 2 when it first got unveiled. Uh, we were looking forward to uh, potentially see this game in, I don't know, was it? What, did it ever have a release date? Adam, no, what's, the chronology, what's the chronology of Wild uh, West? So, I don't know. I think a couple of years ago, they announced a handful of Metal Max projects. It was Metal Max Reborn. Uh, which is a remake that actually just came out again in English. Uh, mm-hmm. Apparently, I'll take a small uh, detour here. Apparently, that this new version of Metal Max Xeno Reborn or Metal Max Xeno, the Reborn version, is apparently like not necessarily better than the original because of some of the changes it made. Like, I guess it just like cuts out some events and scenes and all whatnot entirely, and the balance is weird, and like the enemies are different, and 
So it, it seems like it's weird from what I've heard. I don't think anyone here is reviewing this because no one was interested in it. Anyways, that was one of the announcements. The other announcement at the time was Metal Max Xeno Reborn 2. We didn't have like any information on it other than that it had like new characters. Then they announced something called, uh, there was like, uh, shoot, it was like Project Dogs or Metal Dogs? Metal Dogs, which is like a roguelike action game with like the dog characters in Metal Max. And that game's actually out on Steam. It might just be Early Access or something, but it's out. And then there was one last thing that was like code, code something. Uh, anyways, they announced these four games all at once. So basically the, the, chrono- the chronology for Metal Max Wild West was basically it was announced, it was renamed, and now it's canceled. We barely saw it. Oh, okay. So if you were really looking forward to Metal Max Reborn 2 slash Metal Max Wild West, it's unfortunately been canceled. Yeah, it's, it's such a weird like timing too, because like as Adam said, like the Western release of Metal Max Xeno Reborn like came out like yesterday as the time of this recording. <laughs> so code Zero like, was the code game, which is like we don't know what that is. And even Kite put it in his news post, like, is this still a thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And that kind of covers uh, at least the highlights of things that were shown in all of the like summer gaming pressers that have revealed so far. And then that's not absolutely everything. There's other games that have had new trailers that we have covered on previous episodes of the podcast, such as Batora. Um, we got some other new games that are releasing next year that have been announced, such as a turn-based roguelike card battler called Zoe T. Um, we got some other things for some like farming sims that we've covered on the site and we've got some other games that we've covered previously that got new footage such as the um turn-based cyberpunk rpg key locker it got kind of a, a new trailer that showcased a lot of footage so what basically what i'm saying is is that we kind of tried to cover all the highlights here uh, of all the different typically smaller projects that got new look-ins, new footage, new announcements of release windows over the last couple days. Uh, but we do have them all up on the site. So go ahead and give that a, a view. Uh, we've been pretty exhaustive. And like I said, Adam, Josh, James, and myself have put it all together, Kite as well, uh, to make sure that all of that gets up to date as we keep all of our release dates squared away and all the new footage up in uh, on the site for you guys to look at. No, I was going to go I, into the uh, what to look forward to. Yeah. I was about to mention that too. So yes. go for it. So uh, the thing is, at the time of this recording, we are recording this the day before the PC gaming show, the Xbox and Bethesda showcase, and about a week before the recently announced Final Fantasy VII 25th anniversary live stream on June 16th. So Not chances to are there, there's also the Capcom thing on Monday. Oh, yeah, the Capcom thing as well. So there's a lot of other showcases that uh, at the time of recording, we have not seen yet. At the time of you listening, you might have seen. Uh, so those might be some bigger projects, some things obviously looking forward to the potential tease of a new trailer for the follow-up entry to Final Fantasy VII Remake uh, and other things working on, on the Square Enix side of things, what we might see from Capcom. So we will, of course, touch on all those things in the next episode of the podcast as they become available. So stay tuned for all of those things. And then other than that, we're also coming into the release window of games like Prime Emblem Three Hopes, Live Alive, Digimon Survive, Xenoblade 3, and getting into like all these releases. Uh, August, I believe that's when um, Soul Hackers 2 comes out. We've gotten, of course, more footage. We didn't cover it in the podcast, but we got another uh, another video clip from that game this week or in the last couple of weeks. We've got a bunch yeah, of those all listed on the site. Yeah. They shut off like the English dub for Soul Hackers 2. Mm-hmm. No new footage, but you got to hear the first look I mean, at the... In the to show. be honest, barely. Like yeah. we heard like four lines, like some from and, Ringo, and two of them are Ringo. Big. Did they? Yeah. yeah. They who the so, voice actress is? No. I mean, no. We, we heard like, guess, two lines from Ringo and two lines from Fig, I think, and that was about it. Okay. I mean, it, Grand Blue also had a similar thing where the, with the delay announcement, they had like a little clip on their social media thing with Grand and um, whatever the chick's name is, the one with the, the blue hair. I already forgot. Uh, Lyria. Sure. Um, and then they, yeah, they're, 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 they're lines sure. in English. It's like, oh yeah, this game is getting an English dub. I've totally forgot it, that it was. As we've been recording this podcast, Adam has literally been put uh, putting up some uh, other news things that have been announced uh, in like the hours preceding our recording here. And I'll just give this one a shout out here near the end of the podcast. We got an announcement during Wholesome Direct about an RPG called Paper Animal RPG, very clearly on its sleeve, wearing the inspiration of Paper Mario or Paper Mario RPG. Uh, this game was just recently announced. It's going. To, it's planning to have a Kickstarter campaign soon. So that means it's probably a ways off, but we got a new announcement trailer for Papal Animal RPG. Looks really cute. Looks really fun. And obviously other games such as Bug Fables that have 
released in the same vein have been received really well. So uh, we also have that up on the site if you're interested in uh, a cutesy new take on that style of RPG. So we will be back next week, of course, with all the details of whatever comes out of the Capcom event, the Square Enix event, the uh, Xbox event, and anything else that's potentially missing. The PC gaming show, there's been some rumors there uh, about a Steam page for a Rune Factory 5 uh, DLC showing up before the game itself. We'll stay tuned and see what that was all about. And you'll hear from us then. Uh, You can always view all the news that we covered up on the site at RPGsite.net. You can join our Discord by going to discord.gg slash RPGsite. You can follow us on all the social media channels, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, YouTube, we uh, have been using that a little less frequently outside of the podcast recently, but we do have the preview footage up there from Scott for Marvel's Midnight Sun. So go ahead and give that a look if you're interested. And we'll be back next week to talk about all the uh, things that are announced in the uh, upcoming events that we listed earlier. So until then, stay safe and take care, and we'll talk to you next time. Later, everyone. Inhaling Dragon's Dogma 2 Copium. (laughs)